hi everyone uh, this is the analysis and explanation video of uh, robert browning's my last duchess and this is going to be uh, probably the last video for this semester as we uh, has we have come to the end of uh, this our syllabus my portion of the syllabus so let's begin with this video uh, this is going to be a detailed analysis and explanation for uh, Robert Browning's My Last Duchess, which is a part of your CC10 Victorian Poetry Syllabus. So, in the very beginning, let us just do a small recap about the dramatic monologue as, the, uh, as like Ulysses, which we have done previously. Uh, this too, this poem too, uh, as I've said, is a dramatic monologue. Uh, so, it's a long speech or a narrative. Uh, it is spoken by a single person who is essentially not the poet and uh, in in uh, my last duchess robert browning actually tells you who the speaker is uh, and uh, there is the person called ferrara uh, and robert browning points that out uh, before the dramatic monologue begins so in this case like like in the previous case uh, the speaker was ulysses himself uh, in my last duchess the speaker is actually the duke of ferrara and uh, obviously it's not the poet uh, and that's uh, that speech that single uh, long speech is spoken at a very critical moment or a specific situation and here we see uh, duke of ferrara uh, delivering that dramatic monologue uh, while he is in company with another envoy from the count and uh, the duke is showing uh, that count a picture of uh, his last duchess which is painted on his wall in his castle and this speech uh, makes the whole of the poem of course in like any dramatic monologue the single speaker addresses or interacts with one or more people who do not speak and whose presence or activities uh, can be assumed from the speech of the single speaker as uh, I've told you that uh, the single speaker here is the Duke of Ferrara and uh, he addresses and interacts uh, uh, with one or more people here one people who we can be sure of having uh, being present is the envoy from the count and also in the last part of the poem uh, the Duke of Ferrara says that let's go down and meet the company so there there are presence of other people who we see whom we feel the presence of other people in the course of this dramatic monologue but they do not speak and their presence uh, or any other activities can only be felt by um, when this main speaker the duke addresses them through this monologue or speech the poet desires to reveal the char character or the temperament of the single speaker so and this desire influenced the poet's choice of words and expressions like in ulysses we have seen that uh, at at the end ulysses said that is my plan my plan is to go beyond the sunset so uh, we we have the poet by the whole poem actually exposes ulysses and its and the intricacies of his mind and similar here through this monologue uh, robert browning tries to explain tries to expose the very convoluted and sinister mind of this duke through the whole poem so with that uh, the basics of the dramatic monologue uh, let's uh, go on to more uh, something more specific to robert browning and this poem now of course as i have told you in the previous uh, lecture about uh, ulysses all the three poems that you have in your cc10 that is uh, ulysses by tennyson uh, my last duchess by robert browning this one and uh, also uh, uh, the third by uh, matthew arnold uh, that is dover beach all three uh, poems that you have in your cc10 syllabus all of them are dramatic monologues but of, and dramatic monologue actually developed and uh, were widely practiced uh, majorly in the victorian age but uh, it is robert browning uh, among these three that uh, 
who was considered to have perfected this art of dramatic monologue and uh, Robert Browning's dramatic monologues and many there are in number they are uh, considered to be the greatest examples of dramatic of this form the dramatic monologue and some of the most famous uh, most popular widely read dramatic monologues of Robert Browning are My Last Duchess that is this poem uh, Porphyria's Lover that is uh, very, that is very popular and which is uh, very frequently read uh, along with My Last Duchess because there is some kind of eerie similarity between the two. Uh, there is also Fra Lipolipi and Via del Sarto and uh, the bishop orders his tomb at St. Praxis Church. So all of these are very very popular uh, dramatic examples of dramatic monologue. Uh, of the form and also the very popular poems, very popular works of Robert Browning himself. So with that let's move on to uh, Browning and the Italian Renaissance. Now if you have read uh, at least a few poems that I gave you in that uh, in that PDF with a, with a collection of curated collection of Robert Browning's poems you'll see that many of his poems have been influenced by the Italian Renaissance and there are varied elements of Italian Renaissance that uh, we can find in Robert Browning's poem. So Robert Browning's uh, fascination with the Renaissance period, with this Italian Renaissance period is what makes, uh, is what reflects in all these poems. There are many ways that the Italian Renaissance uh, gets reflected in Robert Browning's poems uh, because of his fascination with this age. Uh, first is the setting of his dramatic monologues. Uh, the settings are uh, almost always in, in this age of Italian Renaissance. Uh, even in this poem, uh, My Last Duchess, the setting is uh, the Italian Renaissance and a duke uh, set in that Renaissance age. Renaissance values, uh, Renaissance aesthetics uh, and morality are reflected uh, in, the, in Robert Browning's poems and uh, these uh, elements they capture the spirit of that Renaissance age and it is very common in Robert Browning's dramatic monologues. But uh, why, do, why is Robert Browning so engaged, so preoccupied with uh, this Italian Renaissance? Why is he using elements of Italian Renaissance? Why is he so fascinated with the uh, Renaissance age? Because uh, Robert Browning is using this Renaissance framework to actually criticize uh, aspects of his own Victorian society. And there is stark similarities between uh, the this age of Italian Renaissance and uh, Robert Browning's own contemporary age which is, which is the Victorian age. As we read this poem as a Victorian poem, we'll realize that uh, we can relate more about the things which I've discussed in, in the social and intellectual background of this age to, uh, with, this Italian, with this age of Italian Renaissance. And that is the same reason why Robert Browning uh, uses this age uses this framework, uses those values and aesthetics of that age to, to construct his poems and situate his poems in that age because he actually is drawing a parallel, parallel between that age and his own Victorian age. With that we move on to the uh, effects of Italian Renaissance that, we, that is there in uh, our poem, the poem in our syllabus that is the last, My Last Duchess. First of all, as I've said, is the setting and uh, Robert Browning uh, states very clearly that uh, it is the Duke of Ferrara and Ferrara is uh, a province in northern Italy. Uh, so as uh, it is the Duke of Ferrara, obviously the setting is, is the Ferrara of northern Italy. Uh, the character Duke, uh, it is uh, Robert Browning doesn't clear who, which, uh, which Duke he refers to. Or is it just uh, an imaginary character that he creates for this poem? But uh, we can, as a week, some historians, some critics assume that uh, Robert Browning actually uh, is portraying this Duke uh, Alfonso II of Ferrara, who had a similar story of murdering his wife. 
so this is uh, this might be that character of the duke and uh, robert browning portrays the duke as a collector of art and uh, a the art collector is uh, the collection of art people collecting art being a connoisseur of art that is uh, actually imitating the classical past uh, which is very common in in a renaissance period what is interesting is that uh, this collection of art uh, is actually without any consideration of any aesthetic or spiritual value in the works of art it is rather just an elite statement uh, that it's kind of an elitism it's kind of a superiority uh, that uh, it's it's kind of a high class society that uh, wants to make a statement with this uh, art collection and flaunting the art collection which is again uh, a spirit the spirit of this renaissance age and the portrait of the duchess by fra pandolf the artist also reflects the renaissance realism and of course uh, the character of the duke as the proud arrogant authoritative duke also reflects uh, this uh, renaissance spirit and uh, the patriarchal spirit that ha happens to be there in the renaissance age so uh, both um, this italian renaissance and how uh, robert browning uses it and how it, how he uses the framework in in our poem the syllabus in our, in our poem which is part of our syllabus it becomes very important uh, in the study of this poem now we go on to uh, how we interpret uh, how we interpret this uh, dramatic monologue by robert browning now uh, while reading this poem robert browning uh, style robert browning writes in a way that uh, that necessitates multiple layers of interpretation of any of his literary works now for last touches i have uh, structured th three main ways in which we go on to look at this poem when we discuss is it in detail the first is the literal level and i've tried to uh, make points about uh, how we interpret each of this level the first is of course the literal level when he, we and when we interpret the poem as a as in the literal level we we are introduced to a duke uh, who, who is the duke uh, ferrara uh, and he is introduced as a widower widower is someone who has lost his uh, wife uh, and has not married since then so duke uh, this duke is introduced as a widower and uh, in the setting of the poem in the plot of the poem uh, this duke is meeting an envoy or a representative of a count an italian count uh, whose daughter he wishes to marry so uh, the duke is uh, a widow a widower his uh, wife has died and now he is meeting an envoy of the count uh, whose daughter he uh, wishes to marry next uh, who is go that daughter is going to be the next uh, duchess and uh, the duke uh, when meeting with this envoy uh, the duke shows the envoy a painting of the last duchess the last duchess that uh, who is now dead and uh, they talk about her uh, so not they like uh, the duke talks about her the envoy only listens is a passive listener uh, that happens through whole of the poem and at the end of the poem uh, the duke uh, expresses his desire to marry the count's daughter and of course he talks about the dowry that will be involved uh, in that matrimony uh, so this is the literal what happens in the literal level but uh, what is more what becomes more important in uh, browning's uh, browning's works is that the underlying meanings that are there in in his works and the first one is the psychological level and this monologue becomes uh, beneath the beneath that literal surface of that story this monologue becomes a psychological study of the duke of the mind of the duke and how convoluted and how dangerous his mind uh, is and how it works 
so and it unfolds uh, the duke's psychology in layers and it it, it exposes the duke in such a way uh, that uh, we get a completely different uh, sinister image of the duke uh, towards the end of the poem we realize through as the poem progresses we realize how dangerous the duke is so that happens in the psychological level and also in a thematic level or a social a socio cultural thematic level the poems then the poem then becomes a discourse on gender uh, on marriage on power morality and equality and all these themes come together which makes the makes another thematic layer of the poem that that happens beneath the that literal surface and of course because uh, this is uh, about uh, gender true and in extension this becomes a comment on the position of women in the victorian society and through a representation of that uh, italian renaissance age which uh, robert browning chooses to be the setting uh, to be the source of his aesthetics his morality and therefore and in that way he draws a parallel between that italian renaissance age and his victorian age in which he writes and it becomes a comment on the position of the position of women in victorian society so all these three levels it all these three layers works together to create meaning of this poem so with that uh, introduction let's uh, now move on to the main text of this poem that's my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive so at the beginning of the text we uh, see that this is spoken by ferrara and it's in your text it will be written in capital ferrara and after that uh, the text starts it is like a di- it is like uh, when you read a play when you uh, actually go through that those di- dialogues before a dialogue begins begins before uh, a dialogue or a soliloquy begins we have the name of the speaker like macbeth like lady macbeth like macduff or duncan so this speech starts with ferrara and the po- the poet wants to make sure that we take it at the take that whole speech this whole monologue as being spoken by the duke of ferrara so at the beginning of this poem we know only of one one character that is the duke of ferrara till till here we uh, are not sure whether any one else is present in the poem and we realize that there is someone whom the the duke wants to show the duchess painted on the wall and he says that's my last duchess painted on the wall look uh, she looks as if she were alive and he says my last duchess and even the title of the poem begins with that my last duchess and this is a sense of belonging she belongs to the duke the she was like his property the duchess and from that very first word rather these these layers of meaning starts to unfold and on the surface level on the literal level it 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 is kind of kind of simple that the duke just is pointing to a portrait on the wall portrait that has been drawn on the wall and that is the portrait of his last duchess his last wife and he is showing that portrait to someone else like look, look that is my last duchess painted on the wall but these underlying layers of meanings starts to unfold from the very first word now my last duchess as if she the last duchess she belonged to the duke she was like his property and this reflects the predicament of the victorian women Uh, who have no rights and these victorian women were only a property to the uh, to their husbands which is why the duke could say that is my last duchess of course uh, this poem is situated in the renaissance age and of course the same thing this uh, lack of rights and all the women only being a property of their husbands were actually uh, about the italian renaissance age which robert browning one have, have portrayed but actually in extension it also becomes a comment on the victorian women positions 
so that is my last duchess painted on the wall and the duke uh, has a name robert browning points that out that this is the duke of ferrara and uh, the duchess she has no name she is only the duchess and uh, her identity uh, only comes from being the wife to a man she is the duchess she has no name and she is painted on the wall now the first question that comes to mind that why is she painted on a wall because paintings are often done uh, more often than not they are done in canvas like wall painting is a very different thing and in renaissance age uh, paintings were done mostly in canvas so we are not sure if it's really a renaissance thing that painting being directly done on a wall now we interpret this as a painting on a wall uh, that cannot move from its place a painting on a canvas can be moved away from its place but a painting on a wall cannot be moved now of course the duke doesn't want the painting to be moved from its place and the duke will keep the painting exactly where he wants it and uh, there is another layer of meaning here which uh, which will give out later in the later stage when we uh, go to that part of the poem but right now the painting is has been done on the wall so that the painting cannot be moved it remains exactly where it is throughout and he says the duke says as if she were alive and from the very beginning we know that uh, as if she were alive means because uh, she is actually not and there is this ambiguity about her death uh, we know that she is dead dead but we don't know how and why and looking as if she were alive and she looks so lively on the painting and we understand that she is a, a she was actually a very lively person when she was alive and we learn more about this later i call that piece of piece a wonder now and one very important thing in this poem is browning's use of punctuation so the duke says that i call that painting a piece of wonder now so and there before that now there is this comma now he appreciates this image of her and as if she were alive i call that a piece of wonder now the duchess was never appreciated when she was actually alive when she was a flesh and blood woman the duchess was was never appreciated the duke appreciates her now now that she is only reduced to an image and this is very important because as if women can only be admired when they fit into an image and that image that has been constructed by patriarchy and when a woman fits into that image only then she can be called a piece of wonder only then she can be admired only she, then she can be celebrated no one would celebrate a lively flesh and blood woman not even the duke but later we also realize that the duke's appreciation of her image that painting of the wall uh, as a work of art both of these are vague she the duke doesn't appreciate the the life when when she was alive the duchess when she was alive the duke also doesn't uh, appreciate the painting he doesn't value the aesthetic value of the painting it's rather a very vague appreciation of the painting the duke doesn't have any emotional reverence from for the art nor he has anything for the duchess both are very surface level both are very superficial both are very vague fra pandolf's hands 
walked busily a day, and there she stands. Now, Fra Pandolf, uh, the Duke says, "Look, that is the painting on the wall. It looks as if she, she was alive." And remember, this is a painting by Fra Pandolf. He is very proud to announce that this is a painting by Fra Pandolf. Fra Pandolf is an imaginary Italian painter, uh, and his name. that the the fact that this painting was done by uh, fra pandolf his name of the artist becomes more important than his artistic merit and it this reflects the duke's superfluous snobbery and that is the spirit of this renaissance age and that is also the spirit probably of the victorian age the name of the artist because because it is done by an elite artist that is why it is important it the pic, the painting is not important the painting is not a wonder because it looks good because it has any artistic merit but the painting is important because it is done by a famous painter like fra pandolf that name becomes more important than the painting this was also in the literal sense very straight forward until we try to interpret it in one more layer now fra is the italian term for for friar and friar is like a monk friar is a member of the religious order now a religious painter he makes the paintings that are kept in the church why would a duke hire a religious painter to actually paint his wife now the duke has hired a religious painter to paint his duchess the friar pandolf a religious painter because religious men are vowed to chastity they are required to remain chaste the duke suspects that any other painter might have an affair with her so this the duke wants this safety this guarantee that the painter which he hires will not have any affair with his wife so that is why he hires a religious painter to do the work and this actually reflects his from the very beginning reflects his insecurity and his way of control how he controls how he wants to control his woman then again he says that this fra pandolf's hands worked busily a day now even after hiring a religious painter to prevent any possible affair the painter fra pandolf was allotted one day to complete the painting and then again he says that there she stands like this is a full full painting of a person who is standing so duke expected that repeated meetings between the artist and the object of his art might develop a bond between them might develop develop a romantic bond between them even after hiring a religious painter who has had this vow of chastity the duke is still insecure that if there is many more sittings in which fra pandolf tries to complete the whole painting they might develop some feelings some bond between one another and the duke cannot allow this so even after hiring this religious painter he has allotted one day to complete the whole painting and he says there she stands this is a full painting not just the face or the shoulders this is the whole painting of a lady standing and the sheer impossibility of the task to be completed in one day and this is all because the duke was suspicious that the duchess was unfaithful he is suspicious of her unfaithfulness so from the very beginning we realize how insecure how perverted 
how rigid and obsessed with control the duke is would please you sit and look at her now this is the first time that we actually feel the presence of another person in this setting beside this duke there is another person and this is the envoy of the count the count whose daughter duke now wishes to marry and this count this envoy was sent probably by the count to discuss about the marriage and in in this scenario he is showing the painting of his last duchess to the envoy of the count now the duke says will you please sit and look at her and this is a rhetorical question this is actually a command because the duke is so controlling the duke is so powerful that the duke doesn't request people he commands people so this becomes rather a very rhetorical question this is actually a command i said fra pandolf by design so the duke has to make sure that it is registered by the this envoy that this painting was by fra pandolf and this is not just by any other random painter this is by the great fra pandolf and the duke wants to make sure that the count that the envoy of the count rather realizes it that this is by fra pandolf and that is why he reiterates the name he says the name three times in the very first lines of the poem and he is desperate to make this impression that he has had this elite great painter fra pandolf to do this painting for him for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance the depth and passion of its earnest glance and the duke says strangers like you like the envoy you never really notice or you are able enough qualified enough to interpret the depth passion or the emotions of this painting now strangers refers uh, can be interpreted in two ways strangers to the duke's family or the household because of course the envoy is a stranger to the duke's household and the stranger he doesn't know anything about what happened before he is just a stranger to the household and the history of this household or this is a very scathing snobbery on snobbish remark on the envoy he is calling the envoy a stranger to the higher arts of fra pandolf and he says that you are not just refined enough to understand and appreciate this art this reflects the duke's superiority it reflects the duke's snobbishness the snobbery the irony is that while the duke come while the duke is uh, feeling so superior that strangers any random stranger doesn't really understand doesn't really interpret the depth of this painting the duke himself hasn't understood the duchess and her human side while she was alive for the duke that is not important what is important for the duke is for everyone to understand to be able to interpret the depth of elite art it is not important to understand the human side of a family member of his own wife rather the duchess but to myself they turned since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there so not the first are you to turn and ask thus and the duke says when when they fail to interpret when they fail to understand the depth of this painting they turn to me because uh, you know i am i can i can be the only one who can remove the curtains for you to see the painting 
and to myself they have turned and this reflects the duke's elevated impression of himself his self-centeredness he has a very he has a superiority complex an inflated image of his own self that he is so superior that everyone actually turns to the duke for explanation and everyone asks the duke the reason for such expression of the duchess the duke's narrative is important because everyone is a stranger to the to the high arts of fra pandolf and it is only the duke who understands the duke's narrative becomes very important the duke's understanding of the expression is final and the duke's explanation when they turn to him becomes the ultimate so the duke has this self-centeredness this inflated image of his own self since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i so it is only in the duke's power to remove the curtains from the painting to reveal the painting and here again we come across browning's use of punctuations punctuations become so important in this poem and punctuation punctuations carry meaning rather and this small part is situated within two brackets these two brackets they represent the curtains and there is this curtain and what is written in these brackets that none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you so it is only in the duke's power to remove the curtain and the curtain resembles control it covered the painting and the duke will decide who can see the painting the duke will control her the duke will control access to the duchess even after her death even when the duchess is reduced to a painting it only remains in the duke's power to decide who gets access to the duchess or rather the image of the duchess i have drawn for you and now when we realize that there is another person duke's psychological manipulation of that person begins and duke this duke is besides being all that evil he is a very fantastic manipulator and he says that i am drawing the curtains for you he is trying to make the envoy feel important he is drawing the curtains for the envoy and the envoy must realize the envoy must be aware of the exclusivity of it it is so special the envoy must feel special and must feel honored that the duke has removed the curtains for him and then again this honor that the duke supposedly is doing to the duchess by removing the curtains for for remove for the envoy by removing the curtains for the envoy to see the painting this honor doesn't come for nothing this honor serves an end the duke is trying to impress also the envoy because it serves an end we will realize what that end is at the end of the drama towards the end of the dramatic monologue we realize how manipulating the duke is from the section and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there so not the first are you to turn and ask thus so the duke says it is men everyone turns to me and asks what is the meaning of such an expression if they dare they ask so everyone turned to me and asked if they dared the reason for such expression in the duke's painting 
so you are not the first you are i so not the first are you to turn and ask us so you are not the first to ask this but we realize through that this is a monologue and there is no speech from the envoy the envoy hasn't asked anything this is a monologue and this is a part of duke's manipulative techniques he puts the question in their mouths the envoy hasn't actually asked anything about the expression of the duke if if someone shows a picture of the of a of a woman who was once alive the first question that any sane individual would ask is how she might have passed away but the duke thinks that that is not important the expression in the duchess's face is important the artist and the great artist who has painted this duchess is important no one asks these questions but the duke puts the question in their mouths the envoy doesn't ask the question and the duke says that everyone ask so we are not sure whether anyone actually asked the duke any question about the expression but the duke puts the question in their mouths because that's how we wants to control the narrative and he says in between two commas if they dust means if they dead not everyone asked because not everyone dared to question the duke everyone is not in a position to question the duke he constantly reminds us and everyone how powerful and superior he is so everyone doesn't question the duke only people who dare to question the duke question the duke and that is also not a question we have no proof that whether the envoy have act, has actually asked or whether anyone has actually asked about the expression of the duchess's face but the duke puts the question in their mouths so that he can control so that he can continue with his own version of the story and he goes on to answer sir it was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek so it is not her husband's presence the duke's presence only that is the reason of such a blush and he talks about himself in a third person and this is again when you when you talk about yourself in a third person is self aggrandizing is is the superiority is the high image of himself so it's like we have this in julius caesar when someone ask julius caesar something he doesn't say that i don't do it he says caesar doesn't do it and talking about himself in a third person is again a reflection of the superiority of that self importance that he gives to himself and he says that that is the reason of that was not the sole reason of such an expression of that spot of joy that spot of joy is a delicate blush or a tender smile in the face of the duchess but this might only be an artistic determinant like the painter who has drawn it might only put a small blush painted a small blush in the duchess's face so that to make the painting more beautiful so this can be only an artistic reason for that expression but we are not allowed to 
leave it to that we are not allowed to believe that it is only the artist's work the duke wants us to hear his own explanation of why there is this blush on the duchess's face what's important is that the duke goes on to answer that question himself so the duke contrives that question and the duke constructs the answer so no one else has any space to say anything we have no proof that anyone actually or even the envoy actually asked these questions of why of the reason of such an expression it is the duke who asks the question it is the duke who will answer he is this overarching undeniable presence and he is powerful enough not to be losing control of this narrative this is the duke's narrative this is the duke's monologue and he leaves no space for anything else he will ask the question and he will answer his own question anyone else has no space to say anything and in this way the duke is somewhat like patriarchy with his overarching undeniable presence at least patriarchy in the victorian age and this is how we realize how the character the theme and the poetic form becomes complementary to each other the duke will not allow anyone else to speak this is his character this is his personality and the poetic form of the dramatic monologue complements his personality because the dramatic monologue allows him to speak forever without letting anyone interfere and it also serves as the theme of this poem the overarching presence of the victorian man leaving no space for the woman or anyone else so the character theme and poetic form becomes complementary to each other this is browning's brilliance and this is how he perfects the art of the dramatic monologue and the duke goes on to answer his question himself perhaps and that too he makes guesses about the things he is going to say perhaps fra pandolf chance to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half blush that dies along her throat so perhaps he makes all these accusations that the blush on the the blush on the duchess's face it is not because of me only it is because of many other reasons why because maybe fra pandolf said her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much so he makes this guesses he makes this accusations only based on his assumptions his guesses and even after hiring a religious painter the friar pandolf and even after allowing him just one day to complete the whole painting he suspects that there have been some amorous affair some amorous exchanges between the duchess and the painter fra pandolf that made the duchess blush now he says fra pandolf might have said he assumes that maybe fra pandolf has said her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much fra pandolf might have said that the duchess's sleeves cover her wrists too much the artist might have wanted to see some more of her skin and also reflects this victorian clothing standards 
this would be immoral because women must be covered as far as possible so any unnecessary display of her skin wasn't entertained because that would be interpreted as being sexually inviting and loose dresses in the victorian age were equated with loose morals i must not say victorian age because i don't see our age being a lot different than this anyway but the duke assumes the fra pandolf might have started to flirt with the duchess and he might have said that your sleeves cover your wrists too much like it would be good if you can reveal a bit more of your skin or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half blush that dies along her throat fra pandolf might make an artist's compliment and have might have said that colors can never recreate that soft blush that rises on her face and fades away along her throat it's a beautiful expression and this is just an artist's compliment that again fra pandolf might have said and it is only a celebration of the duchess's beauty which was according to fra pandolf beyond the scope of any artistic representation because beauty is natural a painting is just an artificial reproduction of that natural beauty so this is again a rather romantic view and of course the duke wouldn't allow that but beside everything else at the end of all these the duke's all these are duke's false suspicion he just makes assumption that these might have happened that might have caused that blush on the duchess's face this last comment dies along her throat might be very lead sinister very scary remark this is perhaps a suggestion or a premonition of her death by strangulation or the slitting of her throat so we don't know what it is this seems to be a very suggestive scary remark so the poem walks out in these layers of meaning uh, there are premonitions and foreshadowing which is uh, browning's style such stuff was courtesy she thought and after all these assumed accusations the duke says and remember the duke is answering his own question no one has asked him why that expression is he asked that question so that there may be space to accuse the duchess the question makes the space for all these accusations all these character assassination rather of the duchess and the duke very shrewdly asks that question so that he can make his own space for his own narrative his own explanation such stuff was courtesy she thought and such remarks and compliments was courtesy to her and it made her blush and it was not only her husband's presence that's what the duke wants to say he is actually so jealous that the duchess was probably receiving su such compliments from other men and that too he assumes and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy so these were enough for her to blush now the duchess is being blamed for blushing now blushing as you know it it's purely a bio emotional reaction or a response of the natural human body and that too is being questioned like we cannot control why we blush 
like someone comes and tells us that you look so pretty or you look so handsome today and we like that person we blush and we hardly have any control of over our blushing now that's purely a bioemotional reaction that happens to everyone that too is being questioned she is being blamed for blushing and as if that too can be controlled so this reminds us of that obsessive victorian control of sexuality because this blushing is kind of suggestive uh, of sexuality amorous comments the duke expects the duchess to control her blushing so this equates with the victorian obsessive victorian control of sexuality that's how i interpret this she had a heart how shall i say too soon made glad too easily impressed she liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere now the duke goes on with his accusations and he says that she was too easily impressed she was impressed by everything and it is totally unacceptable for the duke the duchess how the duke represents her the duchess was so full of life and everything made her happy the duke proposes that this that this uh, behavior of her was because she was very naive and the duke doesn't approve of this at all like she is the duchess she is not supposed to be happy about everything she should have her own elite taste and he says that her looks went everywhere she was certainly crossing her limits and he was suspicious again because she looked everywhere so it was all one my favor at her breast the dropping of the daylight in the west the bow of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her the white mule she rode round the terrace all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least so the the duke tries to explain what's wrong with the duchess and what is wrong with the duchess is that she was made happy by everything everything was happiness for her her admiration what was extended from her husband the duke says that my favor at her breast to nature that sunset the dropping of daylight in the west to other human beings like this officious fool that broke in the orchard for her the bow of cherries and even animals the white mule she rode round the terrace everything gave her happiness and the duke starts by saying my favor at her breast the duke's compliment and the duke expects that this should be taken as a higher happiness than every everything else but the problem with the duchess what the duke says is that the duke's compliment to her was no different from that beautiful sunset from the cherries someone brought for her the white mule she rode everything gave her happiness and caused that blush like the duchess had no prejudice she doesn't discriminate and this becomes fatal for her the duchess was expected to discriminate the duchess shouldn't have been happy with everything everything shouldn't make the duchess happy and make her blush the duke wants to be her only source of happiness 
like his favor at her breast should be treated as a higher happiness and delight the duchess should consider only his attention as special and how the duke describes the duchess we realize the duke was rather an antagonist to the duchess because she was a rather lovely jolly spirited full of life person and every she dis, she doesn't discriminate she didn't have any prejudice and here we have the duke completely opposite of that and here again we have a thing about victorian identity and some officious fool broke in the orchard for her a bowl of cherries the officious fool is some idiot who tried giving her some cherries and broke in the orchard is the image of the bowl of cherries which have been plucked for her but breaking in the orchard also kind of suggests this crossing of boundaries this other man this official officious fool was probably from a lower class than the royal duke and duchess and therefore the duchess shouldn't have accepted the cherries that's what made the duke more furious the duke wants her to discriminate the duke wants her to behave in a way that suits the duchess and this is kind of browning's critique of the victorian aristocracy remember that like tennyson who was the poet laureate of uh, the of this age browning wasn't and he had the poetic license to critique the aristocracy more openly the aristocracy for all its superfluousness all its superiority and snobbery so this is rather a critique of the victorian aristocracy and this gives you a statement about the victorian identity based on class to belong one must discriminate and identity is supposed to be established in opposition to these these other the patriarchal identity of the man is established in opposition to the women other in gender there is also this superiority of the higher class this aristocracy the royalty whose identity was supposed to be established in opposition with the lower class of the officious fool whose gift the duchess wasn't supposed to accept so this is how class identity is formed she thanked men good and it exposes the duke's sexual jealousy now all this isn't a problem but why does she thank other men apart from the duchess this is the sexual jealousy of the duke and it is only so so much ironical and it's rather chilling sinister that the duke says good she thanked men but we know that this thanking of other men doesn't end well for her and again browning's use of punctuation good and there is this exclamation mark which serves as a warning sign this is a premonition that her habit of thanking men 
isn't going to end very well for her. But thanks somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. So she thanked men in a manner and I know not how it the Duke is nowhere in a position to understand her behavior that she thanked men in a manner as if she confuses the Duke's gift of the 900 year old family name her, his family heritage which the Duke bestowed on her by accounts of matrimony with anybody else's gift as if she's confusing this 900 years old name of a gift that the Duke has given the Duchess by marrying her with that small branch of cherries that some officious fool gave to him or a rather flirty comment that Fra Pandolf uh, might have made when he was painting the Duke. And the Duke doesn't understand how there can be such a confusion. The Duke marrying her should be her most valuable gift. Like she, the Duke behaves in a way that he has done the greatest favor. He has done a favor to her by marrying her because now he has married her and he has given her his name. And again, this gives us an insight into the Victorian idea of marriage, which is all which, which was only about class, status, money. It was never about, about emotion, sentiments or love. So that relationship between the Duke and the Duchess isn't important. How he treats her isn't important. What is important is that he married her and had given her his family heritage. Who stooped to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such as such an one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she led herself to be less and so nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse even then would be some stooping and I chose never to stoop. The Duke says now who would blame her for such trivial faults, trifling? Who would stoop to blame? Now it was so below the Duke's dignity to actually go and tell her that she's wrong. She cannot thank other men. She cannot blush when someone else is giving her the compliment and how on earth is she confusing the importance of the Duke's favor at her breast with a beautiful sunshine or a branch of cherries that some idiot gave her. Now it was so below the Duke's dignity to actually go and tell her that she's wrong. This is a trifling, a minor error and this is high irony. Because this trifling has caused her death. Even had you skill in speech, which I have not to make your will quite clear. He says that even if you were a skilled speaker, which I am not, to make your will quite clear through your speech, quite known through your speech, then also I do not uh, go and try to tell her what she is wrong, how she is wrong. But now the Duke is lying. That he is not a skilled speaker. He has no skill in speech. 
because this dramatic monologue this itself is a testimony is a proof to his capacity of speech and his ability of not only to make known his will but also the result of disobeying it now the envoy now knows by now that what happens to people who disobeys the duke so he is lying when he says that i don't have any skill in speech and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there you exceed the mark and if he can actually point out her mistakes her incapacities or where he crossed her limits and if she let herself be lesson so not plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and makes me make excuse and if she is actually willing to be corrected if she is if the duchess actually accepts your criticism without any complaint and she is not even trying to defend herself she is not even try to make excuse even then would be some stooping and i chose not to stoop so even then after everything if the if i have a if i have a skill in speech even if i can point out her mistakes where she had fallen less where she has exceeded her mark and even when she is willing to be corrected even when she is accepting her mistake without any complaint and try not to make excuses even then it would be some stooping even then attempting to correct her would be below my dignity and i chose never to stoop and i didn't try to correct her the duke won't do that it's below his dignity the duke is so full of self importance that he expects his wants to be anticipated like he won't counsel the duchess about her mistake he wants he expects that the duchess should just know he expects that the duchess will understand him and anticipate what he wants before he has to even say it because saying it is too below his dignity oh sir she smiled no doubt whenever i passed her but who passed without much the same smile and now he sums up her mistake and what was her mistake she smiled at the duke whenever he passed her that is not the problem but the problem is that she smiled at everybody and this is the problem this cannot be tolerated and it reflects the duke's character now he is a jealous arrogant possessive obsessive desire to control the duchess he is also vicious and a psychotic how he explains the faults of the duchess this grew i gave commands then all smiles stopped together this grew her smiles continued i gave commands the duke ordered her murder then all smiles stopped together then she was dead and all the smiles the smiles that she have shown when the duke passed her 
the smiles that she had shown when other men passed her, all that smiles stopped at once. And the case was solved. This is like the most sinister, disturbing lines. It is done with short, crisp, crisp sentences which reinforces the Duke's anger, frustrations and the final vengeance. And he says this without any pinch of regret that yes, that this continued, I gave my commands, I ordered her murder and all smiles stopped together. Then my problem was solved. She was dead and she stopped smiling at everyone. Now I don't have any problem with her anymore. And again we come across Browning's use of punctuations. These two semicolons, the first warning, this grew, this behavior continued, I give commands, the next episode, and then the final episode, all smiles stop together, then a full stop, resembling the final solution the duchess's death there she stands as if alive now this line occurs in the second in the very beginning of this poem in the second line this is a recurrence of this line to remind us how we got here now we are certain that she is in the life that ambiguity which, sur which surrounded her death is now cleared. The Duke has set the Duchess to be murdered. Will you please rise? And previously, in the beginning of this poem, the Duke said, Will you please sit and look at her? And now, of course, he is speaking to the envoy. Will you please get up? This is once again a rhetorical question. This is not even a question, it's an order. By now, the envoy knows what the Duke is and what happens to people who disobey or offend the Duke. And through this whole course of the poem, the Duke is also now controlling the envoy and the envoy will sit down and rise whenever the Duke wants him to. He is in full control of the envoy. Now this line again has been interpreted in a different way. It's a kind of a second interpretation. What if the Duke is asking this to the Duchess, will you please rise? And what if the Duke is saying this to the painting? Is the Duke suggesting a resurrection of her character with the next Duchess? As if the last Duchess will resurrect again with the next Duchess. And would the next Duchess meet the same end? Because soon after, the Duke says, I repeat. What does he repeat? And we know that there is a new marriage proposal brought in by the envoy. So there is chance that there is going to be the next Duchess. And will the Duke do the same thing to her again? And now we realize why the Duchess was painted on a wall. She was painted on the wall so that like a canvas she cannot be moved. She was painted on the wall as a threat. 
as a warning that if the next duchess she makes the same mistakes she is going to meet the same end and there is going to be a next duchess as right in the next section the duke says that he will meet the envoy of the count and he is going to meet the other company that is below and he wishes to marry the daughter of the count the next line is they'll prepare to go meet the company below and prepares to meet the other guests regarding this matrimony the painting was done on a wall as a threat or warning so that the next duchess may not repeat the same mistakes it's a warning to what happens to people who disobeys the duke who offends the duke will meet the company below then of and again reflects the presence of other people downstairs also gives kind of the setting of the monologue and this is browning's finesse he perfects the art of the dramatic monologue gives it a plot now we through the through this poem we kind of have a plot we have a setting and some unforgettable characters this is browning's brilliance we'll meet the company below then i repeat i repeat the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretence of mine for dowry will be disallowed now what does he repeat he wants to remind the envoy about the dowry what's problematic here is that with the last duchess it was too below his dignity to even tell her what were her mistakes and i have put the mistakes behind this inverted commas because that is not a mistake after all so it was too below his dignity to even tell her what his mistake was so it's it was better to kill her off but it is absolutely fine when it comes to remind a servant reminding a servant the envoy of the count about his dowry demands so we realize that beside being arrogant obsessive vicious and a psychotic the duke is also a hypocrite and this reflects the victorian compromise the victorian age as an age of hypocrisy this materialism of the renaissance and the victorian age so what else does he repeat this small phrase i repeat becomes very scary will he repeat the same thing with the next duchess there is ample suggestion that he will and she will probably meet the same tragic fate as the last duchess and this duke beside being all these is slowly starting to look at look like a serial killer the count your known master munificence is ample warrant that no just pretence of mine for dowry will be disallowed so the count your master is known to be very generous now he's flattering the envoy and there is sufficient guarantee that all my dowry demands will be met in the first section of this poem i said that that honor that he is the duke is doing the envoy he is remo- he is removed the curtains for the envoy to see and the envoy must feel special that he is being treated in this way it should be an absolute honor for the envoy
And I also said that this actually serves an end. This is the end. He has to impress the envoy in a certain way. He has to make this impression that he is one absolute elite. He is not just any other person. That's why Fra Pandolf was important. He wants to make a statement of his elitism because his elitism will allow him to quote a higher dowry demand and because this envoy will report this duke to his owner that is his master that is the count whose daughter is going to marry the duke is going to marry it is important to make this impression though his daughter though his fair daughter's self as i avowed at starting is my object so although the count's pretty daughter whom i promised to marry in the first place she is my main focus my object and that is why he talks about the dowry first and her later so priority 2 in that order he exposes himself repeatedly throughout this poem he says that he talks about the dowry first and then he realizes that uh, the daughter must be more important than the dowry so after he remembers that he says well no the daughter the count's pretty daughter is my object it's my main focus but he talks about the dowry first and the daughter later he is lying again the daughter doesn't matter he needs the dowry and that is why he wants to marry again and he says is my object women are objects to him women are objects in the victorian society objects to be owned and controlled nay we'll go together down sir so the moment he talks about his master's daughter the envoy starts going down the stairs because he senses the fear he understands the horror of a marriage with the duke because he understand what de- how dangerous the duke is he is also himself probably quite terrified to be alone with the duke upstairs because after the duke says that yes i have murdered or i have my last duke is murdered i have had my last duke is murdered i give the commands it is really uncomfortable for the envoy to go on talking about the marriage so he starts going downstairs as if running away from the duke but the duke stops her nay we will go together down sir so this time it's no more rhetorical questions now it's a direct order you wait we go down together he is controlling her fully notice neptune do taming a sea horse do a rarity which claws of insberg cast in bronze for me now he orders the envoy to see a statue the statue of neptune taming a sea horse this is a statue of the god neptune taming the sea horse it's a bronze sculpture which portrays the roman god of sea neptune taming the this mythic sea beast a sea horse a neptune was portrayed as a barrel chested strong man this is the explanation and this image of neptune taming the sea horse is an appropriate image of the duke and his last duchess he tamed her he tames his women and this is also a foreshadowing of the duke's relationship with the next duchess it's going to remain the same he will tame her and if he cannot he'll kill them off 
this is an image of masculine overpowering and control and kind of this image represents the duke's relationship with his duchess and the next duchess a rarity which clause of innsbruck struck in bronze for me this clause of innsbruck the sculptor is like fra pandolf another imaginary artist and once again the duke wants to make sure that the envoy realizes how elite he is the thing is that the, this duke he possesses art like he possesses women he has no sentimentality he has no emotional reverence to art to either art or his women taming is an art although which he both admires and practices what's interesting is that the poem starts with that's my and ends with for me and it reiterates how self-centered the duke is his pattern is cyclical he says i repeat his perspective don't change through the poem how he looks at women how he tames them how he controls them how he looks at art too how he possesses art these do not change he is rather unmoved after murdering his last duchess and he will probably find another victim and the next duchess will probably be his next victim because it is rather impossible for any women to be what he wants them to be so he will probably find another victim in the next duchess so if the poem ends in this state it leaves us with this sense of with this very tense situation and we realize what it, it's going to be becoming the duchess of becoming the next duchess of this duke and what tragic fate the next duchess is going to meet a little bit about browning style this of course is a dramatic monologue as i have discussed in the beginning this is written down in rhyming couplets you will see that every last word of these sentences meet uh, rhymes with the next last word of the next sentence and it's made like a couplet but there is enjambment enjambment means when a sentence continues uh, without a pause beyond the end of a line and it moves into the next line so the first line let's say of this poem that is my last duchess painted on a wall looking as if she were alive i call so wall and call rhymes but that's my last duchess painted on a wall looking as if she were alive is one sentence so the first sentence moves beyond the first line into the next this is the enjambment and there is no stanza break this whole poem is presented as one uninterrupted monologue it's not like ulysses which had three stanzas which uh, create three diff three quite different meanings and this reflects again the character of the duke his power and authority he doesn't like to be interrupted and also punctuations become very important and punctuations carry meaning the apostrophe the exclamation mark as a warning sign the full stop at the end of uh, all smiles stop together that is the end of the duchess's life and that is the end of the duke's problem 
one full stop ends everything on all smiles stop together so this is the poem i will suggest you to read porphyria's lover by robert browning uh, these two poems are very often read together because there is some similarity uh, and between this poem so with that we end this video all the best